The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome to our webinar on energy efficiency, looking at economic and social relief and recovery in Latin America. We're waiting for a few more people to join, so please bear with us and we'll begin the webinar shortly. Thank you. Hi, everybody, um, and welcome to our webinar on energy efficiency in a time of COVID-19, a vehicle for economic and social relief and recovery in Latin America. Um, we're very glad that you could join us, and we hope that you and your loved ones are well in these very difficult times. I'd like to begin by uh, explaining a little bit the webinar platform in case you're not familiar with it. Um, this is the, the general interface that you should be seeing uh, throughout the webinar. Please feel feel free to enter questions into the question box that you see highlighted here on the right. Um, at the end of the session, we'll have um, an opportunity for questions and answers, and we'll be pulling questions from the question boxes. And please feel free, while the webinar is in English, please feel free to uh, write questions in English, Spanish, or Portuguese. And if you have any problem with the audio connection, there is also the option to call in. And in the email that you received for the webinar, there are numbers and a link to more phone numbers. Um, and you see the access code here before you, and the audio pin would be shown after joining the webinar. So today we have three presenters. My name is Edith Bayer. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues uh, in the Energy Efficiency Division of the IEA, Michael Opperman and Ghislaine Kiefer. Um, and we have all been working on the issues that we'll be presenting today, looking into the effects of COVID-19 on energy consumption, on energy efficiency, and on the opportunities that energy efficiency presents to align with broader uh, stimulus and recovery objectives. So um, to start off, I'd like to just address why we're talking about energy efficiency. Um, there are a lot of benefits that we see to energy efficiency and energy um, savings policies and, and programs. Um, and today it's more important than ever to recognize the, the broad values that energy efficiency offers. The IEA has for years been collecting data and analyzing progress with energy efficiency, um, energy efficiency measures. And in the context of COVID-19, we've redoubled our efforts to assess how energy efficiency fits into the context of uh, the economic relief and, and recovery that, um, that, that all of us are facing. And so here I've highlighted a few of the, of, the, of the reasons that we think it's really important to focus on energy efficiency today. Um, first of all, they're a source of very often shovel-ready local and sustainable jobs. Um, for instance, uh, many energy efficiency jobs are in the construction sector, um, and those by their nature tend to be local jobs um, that can be ramped up quite quickly. Um, energy efficiency is important for resilience, um, and here we can talk about resilience of the energy system, reducing the load on the energy system and on electricity systems in particular, um, resilience of the building stock, so making buildings um, more resilient to, to heat, to cold, um, making them more comfortable and healthy places to live. Um, 
and resilience of economies. We'll talk quite a bit about the economic impact of COVID-19 and the opportunities that energy efficiency offers. Energy efficiency is also very important in discussions around ensuring decent housing, affordable cooling, and lower bills. Um, it's also very important in the discussion around air quality. Um, this, this applies to, to the transport sector in particular, but also to energy efficiency in other sectors as well. Um, and, and last but not least, energy efficiency is key to meeting climate change objectives and sustainable development goals. So it's, it's, it, it remains a key ingredient to aligning with the, the goals that, that many countries around the world have set. Um, before talking about the current context, it's important to look at where we were before COVID-19. It's difficult maybe to imagine life before or to remember life before while we're in the midst of this of this really, really shocking crisis. Um, but if we look back at the analysis that the IEA was undertaking, um, we can see that um, there was a there was a trend that we were highlighting, um, a worrying trend of a, a slowdown in energy efficiency improvements around the globe. So what this chart shows is the rate of improvement um, in reduction in energy intensity over time. So we can see that between 1990 and 2010, um, the, the rate of reduction was about 1.3% improvement in energy intensity. Um, from 2011 to 2014, we saw a gradual improvement in that rate, a gradual increase to 2.1%. And then in 2015, we saw, we saw that increase to, to a 3% um, um, reduction in, in primary energy intensity. Um, but since then, we've seen this number contract. And um, this is worrisome, um, among other things, because we see that it falls short of the rate of improvement in energy intensity that we would need to see to meet the sustainable um, development goal targets. Um, and, and so in order to, to meet that target now, given the slowdown, we would need to ramp up the improvement in primary en energy intensity to, to a 3% um, annual improvement rate. Um, the good news is that, that we're finding that there's still considerable cost-effective potential to improve energy efficiency, um, and so there's no reason that we can't go back to um, the level of improvement that we saw in 2015, and indeed a level of improvement that we see uh, many countries meeting and even exceeding. Um, these here are the, the, the global average numbers. Um, as this slide shows, the, um, the, the global picture is different when you break it down by region. Um, we can see that um, in terms of, of total average energy intensity, Sub-Saharan Africa is the most energy intensive region. This is followed by Latin America, um, and uh, I'm sorry, and Latin America and the Caribbean are the least energy intensive region in the globe. But in terms of improvements, annual improvements in energy intensity, we see that um, Latin America and the Caribbean is one of the, the regions with the slowest rate of improvement. So with a lot of, with a lot of um, room for advancement. Um, there was also a lot of work before the COVID crisis on the potential for job creation. And here um, I'm highlighting a couple of, of numbers that were coming out of reports in the region. The first is from, from CEPAL and shows the net job creation um, expected against a backdrop of an energy transition, looking at the period 2020 to 2030. Um, and it's interesting to add here that energy efficiency could create um, uh, more than 750,000 additional jobs in the construction sector. Um, and the link to the report is below the graph. And the, on the far, in, in the bottom right hand corner, um, you can see projections um, from a study done in Brazil um, in terms of the full-time equivalent jobs in 2030 um, that, that one could expect. And if we look at level three, the bolded row um, in, the, in the chart, the, the 1.2 million expected jobs are the jobs that would be expected if energy efficiency were ramped up to align with Brazil's um, NDC targets. So, um, so now I'd like to turn to the to the impact of COVID-19 and and how we've how what we're seeing and how we're thinking about energy efficiency given the new the new reality that we're finding ourselves in. So first of all, um, as we all know, um, there's a the, the tragic loss of life and and the health crisis continues. 
Um, and this is having a very real human impact and also an, an economic impact and an impact on, on the energy sector and on energy efficiency. Um, we also see that um, from January to now, um, pretty much all of the globe has, has um, been affected by containment measures. And these containment measures um, range from full lockdown in the light blue, which as you can see ramped up and now has, has ramped back down. Um, but it also includes partial lockdowns, the closure of non-essential businesses, of schools and universities, and also restrictions on public gatherings. And of course, all of these restrictions on activity have had a very, very real, very direct impact um, on, on employment um, and on GDP. Um, the OECD in its latest analysis projects significant economic impacts in 2020. Um, due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and you can see here there are two, two shaded colors of red. The light red column represents um, essentially a single hit crisis, so without a second wave. And we can see that if we add to that a second wave of COVID-19, which is a very real fear, um, that, that the, the dark red then compounds the economic impact that, that could be expected in terms of um, a reduction in GDP. And we've circled here the, the countries from Latin America that are included in this analysis. So we can see the impact here on Argentina, on Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Costa Rica. Um, and if we, if we look at the crisis in terms of um, what we've seen over more than the past 100 years, we can see that the, um, the annual um, decrease in GDP is equivalent to the worst crises that we've seen over the past century. Um, I don't think this slide surprises anyone. I think we've been reading this in the headlines, but I think it's important to, to underscore um, why, why we're focusing so much on, um, on, on the role of energy efficiency in, um, in economic relief and, and recovery um, discussions. Um, and of course, along with the lockdowns, there's been a really big impact on employment. Um, so these are the unemployment um, forecasts, um, looking at the, the percentage of the, the, the labor force affected um, in 2021 um, in the OECD, and again, in select um, countries in Latin America. Um, and we can see that, um, that these, these these impacts are being analyzed, of course, at national level. And here's one example looking at, at Brazil and looking at the impact of jobs from January to April. So now not a projection, but, but real numbers um, in the agriculture sector, in construction, industry services, um, um, and in the commercial sector. It's important to note, and, and this is something that we'll talk about a bit when we talk about um, cities, it's important to note that Many informal workers um, are not covered by relief programs, and this is a really important area um, to address and, and to keep in mind as well. Um, the COVID crisis has also brought a lot of attention to energy, energy bills, so I wanted to dedicate a few minutes um, to touch on, on this issue and a couple of related issues. Um, so, this is, this is a, a sampling of the measures that different countries in the region are taking to address how the um, economic crisis is affecting the ability of, um, of households and of businesses to, to pay their electricity bills and to afford basic energy services. And there are, there are as you can see, a lot of um, um, relief measures being put in place. Um, both for low-income households, also for anybody affected by the by the crisis, um, for people who have lost their jobs, for for small businesses, etc. Um, and 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 this is a very important element of the the relief packages um, that that we've been focusing on as the IEA. Um, and it also ties into one of the conclusions of the, the Sustainable um, Recovery Special Report that the IEA recently issued. Um, the recovery report, um, my, my colleague Michael will go into more detail into the recovery report, but I think here it's important to highlight that um, the, the measures that it recommends to, um, um, 
to to shift the energy sector towards a, a low carbon, no, low emissions trajectory in a way that also um, contributes to the economic recovery has a very big impact on on consumers, a very positive impact on consumers. And one of those is a reduction in bills. And you can see on the left, we've quantified here the, um, the expected reduction in bills um, looking at oil and electricity in advanced economies. And then if we take out advanced economies and look at the rest of the world, we see an even greater impact um, in the electricity sector. Another important um, topic that we address in the recovery report is the um, is is really looking at public budgets and looking at the in, impact that subsidies have on public budgets. Um, we know that uh, fossil fuel subsidies represent a, a significant cost to public budgets. We also know that subsidies play an important role in terms of um, social protection. So it's a very it's a very difficult issue and an important one to address. Um, in 2019, the global value of fossil fuel consumption subsidies was around 320 billion dollars. Um, in 2020, that number um, could fall to 180 billion dollars, but that's not taking into account the um, additional price interventions that that have been put in place as protections during the COVID crisis. Um, and the graphic that you see here is from, from a slightly older report, but one that provides some really good data on energy subsidies in the region and the, the impact that they have um, on, on GDP. Um, the, the message that, that, we, um, that, that we've developed within the, the recovery report is that the dramatic fall that we've seen in oil and gas prices during the COVID crisis presents, in fact, an opportunity to look at subsidies and to reduce them without increasing end use prices. Um, and of course, it's, it's very important and we emphasize the need to, for a gradual, um, a gradual decrease in subsidies and to ensure that all of the proper protections are there. Um, but it is a, an important issue and one that, um, that's very important when we, we look at, at, um, at public budgets and at um, where recovery money would be best placed. Um, and then another, another important dimension, um, taking into account that a lot of countries in the region do subsidize energy, and this includes subsidies for low-income households, um, is the benefits that energy efficiency can generate in terms of government savings where subsidies are in place. So this is one example from Mexico of a program called Cambia Tu Viejo Por Uno Nuevo. Um, it's a program that, um, that replaced appliances, air conditioners, and fridges in low-income households. Um, and the, the sector was highly subsidized. Um, over 95% of households had, had um, significant subsidies. And while there are a lot of really positive effects that came out of this program, I think that here the, the um, linking to the discussion of subsidies, the really important impact was that the program saved um, saved customers' bills, but also led to subsidy savings of around $83.2 million a year due to the energy efficiency improvements. And this, these are direct savings to the government at the same time that, um, that consumers were also saving. So um, when thinking about the, the, the impacts that energy efficiency programs can have, this is an important one to keep in mind, particularly where, as in this case, um, uh, energy bills are already being subsidized. So now I'd like to hand the um, the microphone, the floor, over to my colleague, Michael Opperman, to talk more about energy efficiency and the economic recovery. Michael, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Edith, and thanks for the excellent overview of the situation of the crisis to date, and also um, a bit of a segue into the, the next topic on the role energy efficiency can play in the economic recovery. And next slide, thanks. So, uh, thankfully, it's not all bad news. While there there is a lot of um, both tragic and also um, less optimistic economic news out there to date, uh, the good news is that there's a range of policy options readily available to governments today in order to deliver economic and sustainability benefits. In developing the World Energy Outlook Special Report on a Sustainable Recovery, 
The IEA has assessed a menu of over 30 energy related measures for key sectors that policymakers could consider as a part of a plan to boost economic growth and create new jobs while building a more sustainable and resilient energy sector. For each of the measures, we examined the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on the energy sector, the job creation potential, the cost effectiveness, and the CO2 emissions reduction potential. Um, and while we'll um, pick a few key facts and figures in this presentation today, uh, the full report and in more information is available on our website as well. Uh, so the sustainable recovery plan is underpinned by, by the three pillars of boosting the economy, creating jobs and improving resilience and sustainability. Thanks. And next slide, thanks. Yeah. So governments are already taking action on the emergency response. You can see here that in G20 countries, emergency fiscal measures so far vary between minus 3% and 21% of GDP. So a very similar and large variation of financial recovery plans that we saw in the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis. You can see as well that the variation is not just global, but also within the Latin American region. With announced fiscal, fiscal measures back on 7th of June 2020, having quite a large range as a percentage of national GDP. However, despite the variation, you can see today that many G20 nations have already committed stimulus measures representing around 5% or more of their GDP, with many countries expecting to announce a second round of packages. Next slide, please. So the IA Sustainable Recovery Plan, with $1 trillion of annual spending through to 2023, is estimated to lead to a 3.5% increase in real global GDP in 2023, above the level that it would have reached otherwise without this spending. In terms of annual changes in GDP, it means that global economic growth each year to 2023 would be around 1.1% higher on average than it would have been otherwise. And the boost to GDP is on average even higher for emerging economies than the boost to advanced economies, and is expected to be sustained well after the initial funding injection and investment ends. Next slide, thanks. Um, here we can see the policy leadership can also unlock private capital. Around 70% of the $1 trillion in annual spending in the Sustainable Recovery Plan is expected to come from private investment sources, with direct public financial support and policy design critical to mobilizing and leveraging these funds. Our IAA and IMF analysis shows a greater need for government financial support in emerging economies in order to unlock that private investment as a proportion of the total investment. Policymakers should consider this in the design of sustainable recovery programs in Latin America. Next slide, thanks. And here's some more good news. As the IA's executive director, Dr. Birol, announced at our global conference on energy efficiency the other day, energy efficiency is a jobs machine. While we can see the strong jobs benefits of investments here in clean energy and grid infrastructure, you can also see that investment in energy efficiency can deliver some of the strongest job support and job creation potential as a part of the clean energy transition. And you can see on the right hand side here that the jobs created per millions of dollars invested are even higher for emerging economies than in advanced economies. Next slide. And to explain this in a bit more detail, you can see that investment in any given sector or project type does not just create jobs in isolation, but also creates flow on jobs throughout the supply chain. So for example, these statistics here from an ILO and ECLAC report, the employment situation in Latin America and the Caribbean from 2018, highlights the jobs multipliers for investment in the construction industry in Brazil, Paraguay, and Mexico. These figures demonstrate that an investment in construction projects is labor intensive, but that the jobs flow not just to the direct jobs on the construction site, but also deliver the indirect jobs uh, throughout the manufacturing supply chains as well. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, energy efficiency is really a jobs machine. And what does this mean in terms of the amount of jobs you get per millions of dollars invested? Investments in energy efficiency, building retrofits and new construction are job intensive. And 
as a significant proportion of these investments goes towards labor costs. The IEA, as a part of the Sustainable Recovery Plan, estimates that for every one million US dollars invested in the buildings and construction sector, you get a return of nine to 30 jobs created, with again emerging economies delivering more jobs per million dollars invested than advanced economies. Um, I'll go through now a few of the, the key benefits of energy efficiency projects, and in particular, um, that building and construction projects can offer economic recovery packages. So the first of these is speed. They offer shovel-ready projects. Many of them have a short lead times from planning to delivery, helping to stimulate investment and in the economy quickly. Um, having said that, we need to note that with the health crisis still ongoing in many nations, that there will be some real world constraints around this. Um, but assuming once the crisis is under control, it will be able to deliver, deliver at speed compared to many other longer, longer lead time infrastructure projects. Building and construction projects also offer scale. Uh, for context, the building and construction and its manufacturing supply chain support a significant number of jobs, around 10% of the global workforce. This means that an investment in energy efficient buildings and construction can also achieve a significant scale at supporting existing and also creating new jobs. It also delivers local benefits. Building and construction projects create local jobs. A program designed to upgrade schools, deliver social housing, or improve health centers will see those jobs appear throughout every town or community, municipality, or nation um, where that infrastructure appears, compared to some types of investment where there's a very locationally specific site, for example, for a large power station investment. Um, whereas in our building and construction projects have the potential to deliver jobs all across cities and, and nations. And on top of that, they can deliver social equity benefits. Public building upgrades, for example, whether public housing, hospitals or schools, provide both a ready to go pipeline of energy efficiency opportunities to create jobs while reducing government energy costs. But they also help to provide essential services of housing, health and education to those most in need. Next slide, thanks. And energy efficient appliances can also deliver jobs. As a part of our report, we estimate that seven to 16 jobs would be created for every million dollars invested in energy efficient appliances. Uh, many of these coming through the distribution and sales of appliances. The job creation effect here is strongest where appliances are manufactured locally. So something for policymakers to consider based on the individual economic circumstances and, and what industries exist in your region. And when policymakers design programs to replace and recycle the old appliance, such as the example that Edith provided earlier from Mexico, the collection and recycling industry jobs provide an extra economic boost, which I'll talk to in a bit more detail later. In general, the benefits of replacing old devices with new high efficiency appliances can cut consumer spending on electricity by around 30 to 50%. And even a small subsidy can significantly reduce the payback periods for consumers accelerating the uptake of efficient appliances and reducing consumer bills. Further, for energy efficiency in general, these bill savings when reinvested by consumers often go into spending in more productive and labor intensive sectors of the economy than spending money on electricity and utility bills. Next slide. Industrial energy efficiency should also not be forgotten and remains a critical sector in the clean energy transition. You can see here on this abatement cost curve um, how much large negative cost abatement the industrial sector offers as a part of the sustainable recovery plan. And industrial energy efficiency delivers other benefits too. It delivers jobs, supports industries and their entire supply chains, which are often SME intensive improving the energy productivity and competitiveness, while at the same time improving energy resilience for the entire system by reducing the demand requirements of energy intensive industrial loads. The industrial energy efficiency or the estimate of industrial energy efficiency as a part of our plan is um, that it delivers around the 10 jobs per million of dollars invested. Next slide. 
And I mentioned recycling before, and as part of the sustainable recovery plan, you can see some of the significant job potential um, from the recycling industry, especially in developing countries. So in emerging economies, recycling industries can create around 15 to 40 jobs per million dollars invested. In developing economies where there are already 15 to 20 million waste pickers working in the informal sector, progress could be made by equipping municipalities with financial resources to take ownership of waste management and encourage the installation of new waste collection and sorting technologies and adopt best practices. This would deliver benefits both in terms of employment, health, environment and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. To give context to the greenhouse gas emissions, by increasing the global average recycling rates for all materials from around the 41% uh, recycling today up to 47% in 2030, we could reduce emissions from material production by around 20% from current emissions levels. Next slide. So now we get to some of the policy recommendations um, on, on what we would recommend policymakers should consider when thinking through the role energy efficiency could play in economic stimulus packages. So the first here is that governments can deliver stimulus at scale and speed by leveraging existing programs, by standardizing program designs and uh, grant application forms, for example, eligibility criteria and contracts and choosing shovel-ready options for retrofits and technology upgrades, such as the example I gave before of uh, leveraging existing uh, public housing or public building sector upgrades. Um, and also considering how energy efficiency can be built into all government stimulus programs. The second year is develop a strong pipeline of new projects. Again, you can do this by expanding existing programs, by fast tracking some of the programs already being designed, um, by supporting the market through government investment in public and social housing or other building and infrastructure upgrades. The third point is to turn short term impacts into long term transformation. And this is a really important point in not thinking of an economic stimulus package in isolation, but think of locking in those long term energy system um, energy bill saving and greenhouse gas and environmental as well as social benefits. So to lock in that step change in the clean energy transition and also maintain a larger amount of the jobs created after an economic stimulus packages end, governments could continue, consider introducing and raising energy efficiency standards, whether for appliances or buildings and construction, alongside um, or after subsidies for specific sectors and technology are uh, delivered as a part of recovery packages. This can help to soften the boom bust cycles that often occur from short term subsidy and stimulus programs. So the fourth point is to tailor support for distressed industries. Uh, some sectors have been severely impacted by the crisis and are likely to require government support packages in order to continue operations. A number of countries have already announced support packages for their construction, vehicle, manufacturing and airline industries, for example. Governments can make sure that Support for these industries is conditional on progress towards other long-term goals, such as sustainability and energy resilience. The fifth point is to mobilize private investment and is a really important one, as you could see in the earlier slides. As part of the plan, direct government expenditure needs to leverage uh, private investment there as well. And the last point is on international cooperation. There'll be significant gains if um, countries can align their actions and coordinate. For example, if a group of countries can deploy a particular clean energy technology, the costs are likely to fall a lot faster than if only one country deploys it to the benefit of all. So cross-border collaboration can be useful in helping to re-establish international supply chains that have been disrupted. Um, but also cross-border collaboration uh, can also support um, investment in energy efficiency through considering the role of international finance as well and the role that can play in the economic recovery as well as the clean energy transition. Next slide. So lastly, I wanted to briefly touch on some other work that has um, recently been published. The IEA has for the last 12 months or so been leading a global commission for urgent action on energy efficiency, bringing together 
23 members consisting of national leaders, ministers, um, past and present, as well as top executives from business and global thought leaders from around the world. Uh, next slide, thanks. And we've recently published as well the recommendations of the Global Commission. Um, many of those are in common with, with the points I just talked through there. Um, but these will also be valuable for, for many folks out there looking, looking at how to structure and shape economic stimulus packages and incorporate energy efficiency, as well as the longer term goals. And it also provides a range of case studies against each of these recommendations. It could be a valuable resource for many of you out there and is available on our IA website. Um, so thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. And I'll now hand over to my colleague, Elaine Kiefer, uh, to present on the role of cities. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I am going to uh, lead you into the topic of cities um, and uh, the role they play from an energy and uh, post-COVID recovery. Next slide. Uh, can we start with the, the next one? So why is urban energy use so important? Um, so I'll uh, just put this uh, um, very complex graph, graph in a nutshell. Uh, this is basically to show the share of urban e primary energy um, as part of the global share of primary energy. And we can see that cities uh, consume about uh, two thirds of primary energy. And of course, the building and the transport sector are, um, play a very important role. And it's about the same proportion for GHG emissions. However, um, while the majority of GHG emissions and energy is um, uh, produced and consumed at the local level, um, these energy uh, levers are not necessarily controlled at the local level. Can you go to the first slide? And so this is the point. Um, so of course, the, the broader trend of urbanization um, put uh, in a global perspective, we are today at 54% um, of urbanization and we are um, uh, geared towards 64% uh, in 2014, uh, which is equivalent to about 80 million additional uh, urban dwellers um, per year, mostly in emerging and developing economies, and this is mostly uh, in Africa and Asia. So Latin America is already um, very advanced in terms of urbanization. However, going back to the, the question of energy, um, <clears throat> if we look uh, at energy and not beyond electricity, about one third uh, of uh, energy decisions are controlled uh, at a local level, uh, one third by national governments and one third are actually uh, shared responsibility. And uh, there we have very important, uh, the role of collaboration across different levels of government. Um, and in particular, uh, regarding uh, building codes, decentralized renewables and mass transit infrastructure, uh, in particular, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, all of these play a very important role in the sustainable recovery. Can we go here? So now we zoom in on the context of Latin American cities. Um, as I said, uh, Latin America is uh, highly urbanized. It's the second most urbanized region. We are currently at about 80%. Um, the, um, the share of uh, poverty uh, is about 25%. And currently 160 million people live in, in informal settlements. And this is a very important characteristic in Latin America um, because socioeconomic inequalities are embedded uh, in the urban form, as in many countries, but in particular, um, the built form of Latin America is low rise. Um, and so is quite um, uh, spread out. And this has, uh, important implications for the transport sector. Um, if we turn to the housing sector, um, it means the, the urban form means that the poor often um, um, build 
the housing on fringe uh, lands and urban spaces, um, which make them even more vulnerable to uh, natural hazards um, and even more vulnerable to climate uh, impacts. And therefore, urban planning, and this is also the reason why the IA is um, uh, going to look in a more holistic fashion at, at energy in the context of multiple benefits. Um, urban planning is at the intersection of many social and spatial equity dimensions. And uh, these, uh, this has very important implications for the framing of sustainable energy um, interventions. Next slide. So just to spend a minute on uh, informal housing, um, in terms of the, the building stock, um, the trend is that currently about three quarters of housing is built, uh, uh, built in the region is informal. Um, the implication is that a lot of these dwellings do not have property titles and uh, pose um, um, significant challenges to urban planners and policymakers, for, in, for instance, for the implementation of uh, building standards and, uh, and uh, energy um, bu building codes in particular. Next slide. Um, as we uh, all have been through um, the COVID crisis, the, our increased reliance on uh, electricity um, to uh, work remotely, access uh, services, online services, um, has shown uh, the reliance on uh, electricity grids and the important dimension of resilience. And resilience can again be taken in a, in a more, uh, uh, in a broader perspective, not just from a pure energy, but also from a, a social um, perspective and this again has important implications um, because of the high proportion of the population at risk of uh, uh, climate uh, impacts uh, in an urban context in Latin America, the high costs uh, at risk. Um, so all of these are underlying that while we are designing uh, um, sustainable recovery programs, building into these programs the sustainability dimension uh, is also uh, going to be uh, very important. Look at uh, enhancing and strengthening local electricity grids, increasing efficiency, um, and improving uh, electricity security by lowering the risk of outages. We turn to the public transit uh, system. Um, we emphasize um, the importance of public transit, not just from an air quality perspective, um, but also in terms of um, socioeconomic aspects. Um, because of the spread out built form of many Latin American cities, um, lower income um, populations rely, are um, particularly reliant on public transit systems. And as we have seen during the pandemic, um, essential workers, uh, nurses, uh, people working in the food industry were uh, very highly reliant on public transit systems. And as we can see from these uh, graphs, um, the <clears throat> ridership has plummeted, which has, of course, generated a uh, major uh, crisis in terms of financial viability. Uh, ridership went down by 75% in some uh, large Latin American cities, um, but uh, operational costs are fixed costs. And so a lot of um, um, transit uh, authority systems are um, currently bankrupt or in a very difficult financial position. So just to summarize the importance of local governments in designing economic recovery programs right now, um, it's of course, there's a wide diversity of, of governance uh, structures. Some countries have more decentralized governance structures, others have more centralized, of course. Um, but the important point here is that there's a very, um, important uh, role for alignment um, in the context of 
uh, urgent economic recovery, aligning priorities, um, um, uh, reinforcing synergies in terms of uh, human and financial resources. And um, this is an un unprecedented opportunity for carbon lo lockout. So anything we do now uh, with these massive uh, stimulus uh, uh, funds uh, will have uh, long uh, lifetimes. And so following from that point, uh, the investment decisions that will be made uh, in the urban transport sector will be crucial. And here I want to emphasize uh, two main points. One is the urban infrastructure. Um, walking and cycling have uh, significantly increased during the outbreak, uh, outbreak of the uh, COVID pandemic, and many cities have re reallocated road space to pedestrians and cyclists, and this trend is very visible uh, in many Latin American cities. However, as I mentioned, the use of public transport uh, in cities has fallen uh, on average between 50 and 90% with billions of, of dollars of uh, revenue losses for operators. Um, globally, the public tra uh, transport sector employs about 13 million people uh, and plays an important role in ensuring accessibility uh, to jobs and basic services. And so without government assistance, there's a risk uh, that jobs would be lost and um, investment in, um, uh, in uh, urban infrastructure can be highly beneficial, um, uh, both at uh, uh, national and at the local level. Now, looking at the uh, electric mobility, um, uh, charging infrastructure is uh, another area that can generate very high levels of uh, local um, uh, employment and that can, of course, uh, decarbonize and improve air quality uh, at the local level. And now I will give um, two examples. The first one is from uh, Mexico City, um, Mexico's sustainable transport strategy, which includes a special focus on the public uh, transport system. And you can see here um, a very clear priority uh, towards equity and reinforcing accessibility for lower income um, areas uh, in Mexico City. And um, so a number of um, activities uh, have taken place, extension of uh, uh, four cable bus buses, the metro bus expanding six to six with six new routes, um, and uh, important focus on uh, maintenance uh, in the system. And of course, a shift to electric mobility. A second aspect where um, uh, sustainable recovery efforts can generate high um, high uh, multiple benefits and, and high employment is the sh uh, shift to uh, sustainable uh, and smart street lighting and Buenos Aires was a leader in this. This is not um, uh, recent, uh, started in 2013 uh, when Buenos Aires became the first uh, city in Latin America to, to shift to 100% LED lights for street lighting. Um, savings uh, on average of 50% uh, uh, in electricity consumption and um, emission of CO2 emissions um, by 44,000 tons per year. Um, an important note is this ha also has a very important implication on municipal budgets. Um, and in particular on the cost of repairs and maintenance. And trying to bring it all together now, um, there are significant opportunities uh, for um, sustainable energy options at the local level in the building sector, as well as in the transport sector. Here, this is a, a screenshot from an upcoming um, report by the uh, uh, um, IEA and the Global uh, Alliance for Buildings and Construction that will be released soon, uh, which shows that cities are, and in particular in Latin America, are a point of convergence of energy demand 
um, as well as um, on-site uh, renewable and distributed resources. Um, and so combining these two aspects uh, can um, be an important step towards sustainable energy uh, and towards the integration of um, uh, renewables um, uh, in the built environment. Um, the World Energy Outlook uh, Sustainable Recovery Report has a special focus on uh, the importance of smart grids uh, in uh, sustainable recovery uh, programs. And here we want to, um, we just want to highlight that, that a lot of these investments happen at the local level, um, uh, either in the form of smart meters, smart uh, grid infrastructure or EV chargers. Um, and so this is an important opportunity again uh, to, to highlight that has linkages at the local level. And finally, um, digitalization, which is uh, a big buzzword uh, right now, and the IA is uh, doing a lot of work to try to um, structure and articulate um, what, uh, what are the policy um, enabling uh, frameworks for digitalization and how digitalization can empower uh, system thinking. And in particular, as I mentioned, uh, uh, smart uh, devices can help integrate variable renewable sources, solar and wind, by enabling grids to better match energy demand to times when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing and these um, distributed um, renewable energy sources are uh, very rapidly deploying in Latin America um, with a major share um, uh, in a distributed form. And so uh, again, Latin America uh, is well positioned to, um, to harness uh, this opportunity. And this is a framework that we um, published in the Efficiency Market Report uh, 2019. Um, we're building on this uh, framework, uh, which is called the Readiness for Digital Energy Efficiency, uh, which includes uh, several components. <clears throat> I just mentioned the importance of uh, grid resilience and security um, and to ensure uh, progress uh, in the path to decarbonization and electrification. Um, and so the digitalization can en enable the role of the demand side uh, to provide uh, flexibility to electricity systems. And again, a lot of uh, these opportunities uh, take place uh, at, the, at the city level and at the local level. So I'll turn over now to Edith for uh, some uh, concluding remarks. Thanks, Gillen. So, um, so thanks very much. And I just wanted to turn attention now to some resources. Um, there's only so much information that we can present in one hour. And uh, even with this hour, I think we've, we've <laughs> included quite a bit of, of information to digest. And we will be um, sending around the presentation and making it available along with a recording of the webinar for those who, who were unable to join. Um, but also um, wanted to point out that uh, all of the resources that we've referred to are available online um, free of charge. So the, and you can see the links here below. So that includes the recommendations of the Global Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency, um, which includes both the 10 recommendations that Michael presented earlier, but also, and I think that this could be really valuable, particularly in the context of, of kind of troubleshooting and trying to find the most uh, effective policies and programs to be ramped up now. There are a lot of examples and case studies that link with the recommendations from all around the world, including from Latin America. Um, so we, um, we, we very much welcome you to uh, to, to visit that report. Um, the, the World Energy Outlook Special Report on Sustainable Recovery is also available. And um, on the energy efficiency portion of the IA website, there are also um, some analyses and articles and we'll be adding to them, um, we'll be adding to them throughout the, the, next, the coming months, I would say. Um, and you can see a couple of these um, up here. 
And I also wanted to emphasize that we have a number of other resources as well that, that we're, again, very happy uh, to, to invite you to, um, to, to visit, to take advantage of. Um, we have uh, on the top left, you see some online courses that we've developed. Um, there are two courses, one on energy efficiency indicators, essentials for policymakers, and the other um, is fundamentals of statistics, also focusing on energy efficiency indicators. And um, the course is open to everyone. You can enroll anytime. There are no time restrictions. There's no cost. We've, um, we've made the courses available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So choose your language of choice. <laughs> and we, we very much hope that this will be a, a resource that, uh, that will be valuable to some of you. Um, we also have an online course that we developed together with CAF on energy efficiency in buildings. Um, that course is, is time limited. So currently the, 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 the Spanish version of the course is closing, but we plan to launch a Portuguese version later this year and might relaunch it again, especially if there's interest. Um, and then just to, um, just to mention that uh, we have a policies database as well. So in addition to the examples that I mentioned in the, the Global Commission report, you can search for policies and programs by country, by type of policy on our website, and you see the link here. And um, at the end of Guilen's presentation, she was mentioning some of the, um, some of the, the importance of digital technologies. And this is something that we're deepening our work on and expanding quite a bit, um, including in Latin America, and we're in a scoping phase now. So I guess two things here. One, please, please visit and see if you can view, you see something useful to you on the website. But secondly, we very much welcome your thoughts, particularly examples of what's happening um, since we're in a in a in a place where we're we're kind of scoping and collecting information. Um, so we, we're pretty much at time. Um, we don't see any questions in the questions box. If you have any questions, um, we, we could probably take one, but, um, but since I don't see any, I think the thing that I'll do is, is just talk a little bit about next steps. Um, and I'll end on this slide because this is the email address where you can reach us if you have any questions. So, I mean, today's, today's webinar really served to stimulate a discussion on what we can do now and in the coming coming months um, to incorporate energy efficiency as part of the stimulus strategy. Um, but in order to get to that, to that point, we thought it was very important to, to really emphasize the benefits of energy efficiency, to look into the data a bit more deeply, to explain the analysis that we've been doing. We'll send a brief questionnaire um, around shortly, um, and we'll be looking for both your feedback on the webinar, but also ideas for topics that you'd like to see covered specifically related to, to stimulus and stimulus recovery. Um, and we really look forward to your ideas and also to facilitating uh, more of a dialogue between countries and cities and decision makers in the region. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us. Um, we very much appreciate your time and um, we're wishing you all very well, uh, particularly given the difficulties that we're all facing right now. So thank you very much.